Welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Rosanna. And I'm Nikki. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where we have just six rounds to figure out how the first degree could possibly be connected to the last while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. Today we are spiraling from the Lincoln Kennedy coincidences to Pamela Melroy. Okay. This starting degree was chosen by our patrons, Sean and Teresa. They asked us Mm -hmm. to start with the Kennedy and Lincoln coincidences, which I am grateful for that choice because this is a great article. I didn't know there were coincidences. (gasps) They're both presidents. No. Oh, there's a ton. I'm really excited to find out what they are. And listeners, remember, one of the perks of being a patron to Six Degrees of Wiki is the opportunity to give us a starting degree. Just go to patreon.com slash Six Degrees of Wiki. Round one. The Lincoln-Kennedy coincidences are strange things that the two U.S. presidents have in common. Pamela Melroy is a U.S. Air Force veteran and a former NASA astronaut. (gasps) Nice. Yeah. So, Nikki, do you see anything that these two degrees have in common? Pamela should be a president, too. That's fair. I don't know what how old she is, so I don't actually know if she's still alive, but I'm in. I'm in. Okay. (laughs) Um... It's a coincidence that I <laughs> that I can't where, finish. Where are you going with that, Nikki? <laughs> sentence. I really should have like thought out what I was gonna say before I said it because I have no idea. Since it's weird that you don't know about all these coincidences, I'm kind of excited. <laughs> this article has a huge list of them. Huge. Oh. Weird. So I wrote down some of the most interesting. So there's a long list of coincidences between U.S. Presidents Abraham Lincoln, who was the 16th president, and John F. Kennedy, who was the 35th president. This list is a piece of American folklore, but its origin is unknown. One of these types of lists, there have been several. One of the types was printed in 1964, which was the year after Kennedy's assassination. And it was printed in the COP Congressional Committee newsletter, which seems pretty fancy for a list like this. I don't know. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Author Martin Gardner also discussed the list in the magazine Scientific American, then printed it in his book called Uh The Magic Numbers of Dr. Matrix. His version was only 16 Mm -hmm. items, but today the list is much longer. There were about 45 points in this article. And here are some of the most interesting. (laughs) Both presidents' last names have seven letters. Both became president when they were in their 30s, married 24-year-old women, and those women spoke fluent French. Both were the second children born in their family. Each president suffered from a genetic disease. Lincoln had Marfan syndrome and Kennedy had Addison's disease. Both presidents fathered four children and had a son that died during their presidency. That's a sad coincidence. Both presidents were elected to the House of Representatives in 46. So in 1846 and 1946. Thank you for that clarification (laughs) over which century it was. I'm just trying to be specific. A hundred years apart. Both were losing candidates for their party's vice presidential nominee in 56. Both presidents were elected to the presidency in 60. Both of their vice presidents and successors were Southern Democrats named Johnson. (laughs) Andrew Johnson and Lyndon B. Johnson. Now it's getting a little spooky. Before I was like, oh, whatever, second sons, but... mm. No, I still have several more. (laughs) Buckle up. (laughs) (laughs) Both presidents were concerned with issues affecting black Americans. So Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and Kennedy proposed Mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
Kennedy was the second president in U.S. history to issue interest-free money. The first was Lincoln. Oh. All right. Now it's going to go even weirder. Maybe Kennedy just took a lot of inspiration from Lincoln. Okay. Well, let's talk about their assassinations. Oh, okay. Okay. Guess. Lincoln sat in box number seven at Ford's Theater. Kennedy sat in car number seven in the motorcade. Both presidents were shot in the head on a Friday, seated beside their wives. Both Fridays preceded mm-hmm. a major holiday observed within that week. Both assassinations occurred in a city that was the 14th largest in the nation, according to the most recent census taken. Lincoln mm-hmm. was shot by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. Kennedy was shot by Lee Harvey Oswald in a Lincoln automobile made by Ford. Creepy. Both assassins' full names have 15 letters. After shooting Lincoln, Booth ran from a theater to a warehouse. After shooting Kennedy, Oswald ran from a warehouse to a theater. Both assassins were shot and killed with a Colt revolver. The doctors who primarily attended to each president were both named Charles. Both presidents had bodyguards named William. And both of the bodyguards named William died when they were 75 years and five months old. This all sounds like a really, really unpleasant case of deja vu. Yeah. It's wild, right? If the gods had deja vu, this is what would happen. Here's an interesting fact that I found in this article. Buddy Starcher, who was an American country singer released a song called History Repeats Itself, and it was about those coincidences and parallels between the presidents. It was a top 40 hit in 1966. Round two. Okay, Nikki, what do you think the next degree is? I got my thing out to write down all my ideas, and I didn't write down anything because it was you all so You do that weird. every time. I know. I tried so hard. <laughs> well, you got to give me something. Okay. Um. I think that I started another sentence not knowing where it was going to end. <laughs> um. Dang it. Presidential coincidences and an astronaut. Uh-huh. I don't know what could possibly get there, but I have to go with... No, we did him already. I was going to go with uh, the assassin dude of Lincoln, but I covered him when we did Lincoln in the first episode. So I'm going to go with Lee Harvey Oswald. He's a pretty important figure in in this part of history, so that's reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Your guess of Lee Harvey Oswald is incorrect. But the next degree is a person. But I will not give you half a point because you're very wrong. Oh, I mean, human really connects connects us all. Eh. No? No. Okay. No. The next degree is Dr. Matrix. Rosanna, that, that sounded like a fake thing when you said it the first time, and now it sounds even faker on its own. Dr. Matrix. Irving Joshua Bush, also known as Irving Joshua Matrix, also known as Dr. I.J. Matrix, is the fictional character created by author Martin Gardner, who was a columnist for Scientific American. Dr. Matrix was introduced in Gardner's column that he called Mathematical Games. He was introduced in 1960 and showed up in this column often. Eventually, all of the columns were combined into a book called The Magic Numbers of Dr. Matrix. Gardner created this character to give context to the math puzzles that he was putting in the articles and to challenge pseudoscientific theories and to add humor to whatever topic Gardner was discussing in that particular article. Makes sense. Now I'm going to tell you about Dr. Matrix as a person. Okay. Dr. Matrix was born in Japan. He was the oldest of seven children, and his father was a Seventh-day Adventist missionary. He learned magic 
and was the assistant to the famous Japanese magician Tenkai. Wait, wait. Was this guy the author is this is the fictional character? This is the fictional character I'm talking about. Okay, okay. He was married and had a daughter. A fake daughter also, because he's fake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Dr. Matrix was a polymath, a scientist, a cowboy, a mathematician, <laughs> and an entrepreneur. <laughs> Cowboy just thrown in the middle there. Yep. He contributed to perpetual motion engineering and biblical cryptography and code, plus numerology, ESP, spoon bending, and pyramid power. Dr. Matrix was often on the run from authorities, and he had to move a lot and use fake names and disguises because he was accused of fraud a lot. Also, he was accused of running a pyramid scheme. He <clears throat> reportedly died in a duel in 1980, but then he resurfaced in 1987 in Casablanca. He had faked his death to avoid retaliation from the KGB. Wow. Interesting fact about Dr. Matrix. He was able to perform logically impossible tasks, like summoning a waiter or a minion by clapping in the air with one hand. With one hand? Yeah. So, okay, two problems. Uh, clapping with one hand, impossible. Well, I did say he could perform logically impossible tasks. Yeah. <laughs> and the summoning, like, like people are the, the clapper, the clap on, clap off thing, but with service people. Yeah. This is why I'm not a waitress. Round three. Okay, Nikki. <laughs> Where do you think we're headed from here? I actually wrote down two items this time. Okay, good. Scientific American and cowboy. Okay. Seeming to have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> Scientific American, I can see it connecting with an astronaut. The cowboy is a little more fun. I choose cowboy. Okay. Your guess of cowboy is incorrect. The next degree is biblical cryptography or Bible code. Do you even say biblical? Was it in like some giant list of weird things? It was. What a surprise. It was uh, j just before spoon bending and pyramid power. No wonder I missed it. <laughs> okay, so before we get into this degree, I do have to give a small warning that is printed oh. in this article. This article has been nominated to be checked for its neutrality. <laughs> I love those. Written in a biased fashion. So listeners, take all of this with a grain of salt. The Bible Code, also known as the Torah Code... It's a set of secret messages encoded in the Hebrew text of the Torah. Specific letters from the text reveal a message that is obscured without having the code. Over time, there have been a bunch of examples documented. One of them is, you take every 50th letter of the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus, and it spells out Torah. In 1994, Doran Witstam... Eliyahu Rips and Yohav Rosenberg published the paper Equidistant Letter Sequences in the Book of Genesis in Statistical Science, which Statistical Science is a scientific journal. Their paper gave strong statistical evidence that biographical information about famous rabbis was encoded in the Book of Genesis centuries before the rabbis lived. So basically, this was a precursor to the Da Vinci Code book? I think it's definitely an influencer. This paper initiated controversy and debate about the steganographic method of ELS, which is that equidistance letter sequence. To obtain an ELS from a text, <laughs> this is complicated, you choose a starting mm -hmm. point and a skip number. 
Then, beginning at the starting point, you select letters from the text at equal spacing as given by the skip number. So like if the number is negative four, they can be negative or positive numbers. If it's negative four, mm -hmm. you read backwards every fourth letter of the sentence. I feel like you could make a computer program that would do this for you. Yeah, actually they did. Yeah, you just change the starting point or the number every time and eventually you're going to find something. I mean. So another example of ELS is done by writing out the text in a regular grid with exactly the same number of letters in each line and then cutting out a rectangle and seeing what you get. That seems like a lot of trial and error for the Bible. Those people that believe in the code say that the longer the extended ELS is, the less likely it is to be chance. But critics think that the longer an ELS is could just be part of the look elsewhere effect, which is more data leads to more patterns. So the more information you have, the more patterns you can find. So having a really long ELS doesn't make it more accurate. It just means there's more to get information from. I have a, a big question for all of this. Okay. When they do this, are they using the original bible in its original language or are they using translations because that's gonna completely change everything yeah both which has been part of the problem yeah the codes have been used by groups from the jewish and christian communities to persuade encourage and convince members to trust in the bible in 1999 a group of mathematicians who were collectively known as MBBK, published a paper in Statistical Science. They argued that the case of Witzman, Rips, and Rosenberg was fatally defective and that their result merely reflects the choices made in designing their experiment and collecting the data for it. They also used words like tuning and wiggle room. So they were really easy on them then. Yeah. There have, though, been several replies to MBBK's criticism. There are actually several replies to both sides of these theories. And there are even other types of Bible codes that people use in different ways that don't follow this method, but are still sort of a code-breaking theory. Interesting fact about the Bible code. Isaac Newton was one of the scholars that tried to find hidden encoded messages in the Bible's text. I think by the fact that he didn't find anything there probably says a lot. Round four. Okay, Nikki, what do you think the next degree is between Bible code and an astronaut? I feel like my choice has been made for me. <laughs> okay. And I have to go with this, even though it seemed like just an offhand mention. Which means it could have been a trick or a trap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I have to go with Isaac Newton. Okay. Because, as everyone knows, <laughs> he's the one who figured out gravity. And in space, where astronauts go, there's no gravity. You float. Is this further than it seemed like in my head? It seemed obvious in my head, but when I'm saying it out loud, it doesn't seem quite as, as cut and dried. Uh, Isaac Newton. Okay. Your guess of Isaac Newton is incorrect. Oh, it just seemed right there. You were not even a little bit close. I'm sorry. Oh, what was it? The next degree is the Book of Exodus. No. Yes. Well, that's not that's not close. Yeah, no, it's definitely, Isaac Newton. Definitely not close to Isaac Newton. <laughs> Except that he probably read the book of Exodus at some point. So the book of Exodus is the second book of the Torah and the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Testament, and it comes right after the book of Genesis. It chronicles the Israelites leaving slavery in Egypt. The Pharaoh was so scared that there were so many Israelites that he forced them into slavery and made them throw all their newborn baby boys into the Nile. Uncool, Pharaoh. Totes. 
One woman saved her son by putting him in a basket in the river, and the Pharaoh's daughter finds him and raises him and names him Moses. Moses is aware of his origins, though. He knows that he's not actually related to the Pharaoh. God visits Moses and tells him to lead the Hebrews out of Egypt. Moses tries to convince the Pharaoh to let them go, but is refused. So God got real irritated about that. And he smites the Egyptians with 10 plagues, rivers of blood, the death of their firstborns, a bunch of gross stuff. Oh, yeah. There were like bugs and it was gross. Yeah. Plague of locusts, frogs, boils. <laughs> it was a mess. So gross. <laughs> we get to go through them all during Passover. Oh, fun. Eventually, Moses leads the people to the promised land and is given the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. Their freedom has been granted to them in return for their faithfulness to God. Israel then enters into a covenant with Yahweh and are given instructions to establish the life of the community and the guidelines to sustain it, which include the Ten Commandments. God also gives Moses instructions for the tabernacle, the priestly vestments, the altar, the procedure on how to ordain priests, and the daily sacrifices that had to be offered. It was nice of God to give him all that information. It was nice of God. Like an orientation. Welcome to the promised land. Here's your pamphlet. <laughs> According to author Carol Myers, the book of Exodus is probably the most important book in the entire Bible because it presents the defining features of Israel's identity. Some of the themes in the books are salvation, a covenant, Israel being chosen by God, and theophany, which is the appearance of God. There are some mythical elements in the book of Exodus, though not as many as showed up in Genesis. Some of the ancient legends seem to have had influence on the book's contents. Baby Moses in the Nile is similar to the legend of King Sargon of Akkad. And the parting of the Red Sea is similar to the Mesopotamian creation mythology. Cool. I love when all that stuff overlaps. I know. I love it, too. And I think probably people that are really religious don't like that. But I think it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting fact about the book of Exodus. Jewish and Christians traditionally view Moses as the author of Exodus, but modern scholars disagree. Their opinion is based on estimated dates and inconsistencies, discrepancies, and repetitions. They say that the timeline just doesn't line up for Moses to have been the author. Round five. What do you think the next degree is? I really want to go with Pharaoh just because I like ancient Egypt. Okay. A lot of but pharaohs in space. I can't see how that would connect. <laughs> to uh astronauts unless there's something we don't know about ancient egypt and they went to space aliens did build the pyramids so of course of course what was i thinking right it's obvious was moses the first astronaut <laughs> how high was mount sinai <laughs> he did meet god right <laughs> how high was moses he saw a burning bush that spoke to him Oh, good point. <laughs> I can't really figure out how to connect, so I'm I'm just gonna go with uh all right, Moses. Okay. Your guess of Moses is incorrect. So he wasn't the first astronaut, is what you're telling me. As far as Wikipedia is concerned, no. <laughs> so <laughs> The next degree is Carol Myers. She was, was she one of the people that talked about? Yeah. Oh my gosh, she was. Yep. 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 You really stuck that one in there. I surely did. <laughs> it's just a reference. Don't pay any attention. Carol Myers is currently in her 70s, um, and her article was not very long at all. Carol Myers is a feminist biblical scholar and a professor of religious studies at Duke University. Her husband is actually also a biblical scholar and a professor. Hmm. 
Myers was born in Pennsylvania. She got her BA with honors at Wellesley College in Massachusetts and her MA and PhD at Brandeis University, also in Massachusetts. She started teaching at Duke in 1977. She writes and teaches about biblical studies, archaeology, and the study of women in the biblical world. She's been described as one of today's leading historians and field archaeologists. In 1988, she wrote Discovering Eve, Ancient Israelite Women in Context. And that was called the first comprehensive effort to present a female-centered view of the Bible using historical criticism instead of literary criticism. Mm. Interesting fact about Carol Myers. She was the president of the Society of Biblical Literature in 2013 and was on the revision team for the 2010 New American Bible. Round six. All right, Nikki. This is your last guess for this spiral. But I did. it all went so fast. Can you read all of that again? No, that's not how it works. Dang it. I think I might end this episode with zero points. Aww. All I can think of is Eve. She had a book, something about Eve, right? Discovering Eve. And I picked nothing else up that made me think at all of astronauting. <laughs> that's not a word. A word now. <laughs> uh, I guess I have to go with Eve. I'm really sad that I don't have anything for this. So your guess is Eve or discovering Eve? Is it the book or the person? The person. Okay. Your guess of the biblical character Eve is incorrect. Bum, bum, bum. I'm very sorry. The next degree is Wellesley College. Now, I remember now that you mentioned it. I did. That's where she went to school. But 20 seconds ago, I did not remember that. That's okay. It happens. I'm assuming that our astronaut went there as well. Let's find out. Okay. Wellesley College is a private women's liberal college in Wellesley, Massachusetts, which is west of Boston. It was founded in 1870 by Henry and Pauline Durant. And it's a member of the original Seven Sisters Colleges. It has 56 departmental and interdepartmental majors and more than 150 student clubs. Students can also cross-register at Brandeis University, Babson College, Franklin W. Olin College of Engineering, and MIT. Oh. This year, 2018... It was ranked the third best liberal arts college in the United States and wow. is considered one of the most selective schools. The class of 2021 is about 22% of the 5,700 women that applied. Wow. The admissions policy was updated to include applications from transgender women and non-binary people assigned female at birth in 2015. Nice. As of last year, it's the highest endowed women's college in the world at nearly $2 billion. <laughs> Goodness. The campus is 500 acres, and the average class size is 17 to 20 students. The faculty ratio is 7 to 1, which is pretty good. Yeah, it is. 98% yeah. of the students live on campus. The library has more than one and a half million books, journals, maps, and other media. They have 13 varsity sports teams, including basketball, cross country, fencing, lacrosse, soccer, tennis, and track. And they don't have a mascot. They're just known as the blue because their school colors <laughs> are blue and white. The Wellesley Centers for Women WCW is one of the largest gender focused social science research and action organizations in the United States and a member of the National Council for Research on Women. It has five areas of research education, economic security, mental health, youth and adolescent development, and gender based violence. Its current president is the 14th president in its history, and that is cardiologist Paula Johnson. She founded the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology. She is one of the leaders of the field of women's health. Other alumni include 
Hillary Rodden Clinton, Madeline Albright, Diane Sawyer, Soong Myling, and Pamela Melroy. <laughs> Interesting fact about Wellesley College, less than half of the student body is Caucasian. Students come from more than 60 countries around the world and from all 50 states. And that takes us to our final degree, Pamela Melroy. Yay. Yay. This was a surprisingly short article for an article about an astronaut. I'd say depressingly short then. I would agree. Pamela Melroy is a retired U.S. Air Force officer and a former NASA astronaut. She's from Palo Alto, California, and has a bachelor's in physics and astronomy from Wellesley College and a master's degree in earth and planetary sciences from MIT. She received her pilot training at Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas, then flew the KC-10 for six years, which is an aerial refueler tank, which sounds difficult <laughs> yes. to refuel in the air. She's a veteran of Operation Just Cause, which was the U.S. invasion of Panama in 1989. She's also a veteran of Desert Shield Desert Storm from the Gulf War in 1990 and 1991. She was selected as an astronaut candidate by NASA. She was a pilot on space shuttle missions STS-92 and STS-112 and was mission commander on STT-120 in 2007, which made her the second woman to command a space shuttle mission after Eileen Collins. Hey. She has over 924 hours in space, which is 38 oh days. Gosh. Yeah. That was a long time. She left NASA in 2009, and then she served as deputy program manager for the Space Exploration Initiatives with Lockheed Martin. Then she joined the FAA, which is the Federal Aviation Administration. She was Senior Technical Advisor and Director of Field Operations for the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. In 2013, she left the FAA and DARPA, which is Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And that is an agency of the United States Department of Defense that is responsible for the development of emerging technologies that are used by the military. She left that office last year. And I'm not sure what she's doing now. Maybe she's just retired. How old is she? Uh, she was born in 1961, so late 50s. Young for that much to be accomplished. Oh, so much. I'm really amazing. Yeah. Here is a very interesting fact about Pamela Melroy. The STS-120 mission was the first time two female mission commanders were in orbit at the same time. The other commander was Peggy Whitson, and that was in 2007. That's cool. I mean, it's sad that it was until 2007 that that happened. But <laughs> We have made it through all six degrees. We went from the Lincoln-Kennedy coincidences to Dr. Irving Joshua Matrix to Bible Code to Book of Exodus, to Carol Myers, to Wellesley College, to Pamela Melroy. Nikki, what did you think of the spiral? The spiral was ridiculous. <laughs> Dr. Matrix is like the most fictional, fictional character <laughs> I've ever heard of. Also, the Bible code stuff is just so weird to me. It just makes me think of the the idea that if you put enough monkeys in a room with typewriters, you'll get Shakespeare. Yeah, I don't think that's true, but okay. I don't either. <laughs> but the Bible is so big, and if you do enough the counting and, and all that lining up words, you're going to get something. Yeah, I think you can find what you want when you have that much text. Yeah. There's a lot to work with there. It was a fun spiral, though. Very weird. <laughs> It's time for Whim of the Week. Our Whim is another item from patrons Teresa and Sean, and they wanted to recommend volunteering. So I'm going to read what Teresa has written about volunteering. I think that she gives us a lot of really great information in this. 
She mm-hmm. says, There are a lot of us living on this earth, and many of us have difficult lives. Volunteering is a wonderful way to help any number of people who could use some kind of assistance. There are so many organizations that make it easy to do something, large or small, for others. But you don't need an organization to spread a little joy. If you have money, you can offer it to charities of your choice. If your grocery store is having a really great sale, buy a few extra items and take them to a nearby food bank. Secretly pay for someone's meal at a restaurant, such as a military person, police, or fireman. If you don't have money but you do have time, you can visit or take meals to the elderly, do yard work for a disabled person, work on fundraisers for a good cause, cook or serve meals in a homeless shelter, or join a service organization. You can play with dogs at an animal shelter, shelve books at the library, or tell a janitor or service worker that they're doing a great job. If you're shy or you're a homebody but you still want to help, see if a nearby school has projects you can take home and work on, like cutting out shapes for kids' art projects, sew or knit hats and scarves and blankets for homeless people, bake goodies and deliver them to your local police and firemen, and if you have no money or no time, pick up trash along your way. There are so many easy ways to enrich the lives of people around us, and you'll likely benefit from it yourself. And that's a really great sentiment, especially going into the new year. Yeah, make a resolution to volunteer. Just pick something that you like or as a service you use and just do one thing. Thank you very much, Teresa and Sean. Thank you for being a patron. If you would like to give a recommendation to our listening audience, become a patron and you'll get to. We have a new review to read from Litflix Podcast. So great. Five stars. Just started listening and this show is amazing. Definitely one of my new top favorites. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. That is nice. The Litflix Podcast is a podcast where they talk about books that are turned into movies. So they talk about the book and oh, the movie. Cool. And I've just started listening recently and it's great. We also got a little message from Amanda from Mafia Minute and her nephews have started listening to our show and one of them said I want to listen to all their episodes even if you've already listened to it you have to listen again which was really adorable so sweet and we're so happy to have some young listeners we are I hope that they're learning all the things that I missed out on when I was in school all this cool stuff about totally random topics you know what I have one more thing to say too Okay. Riley, my daughter who is in high school, told me today that one of her friends was talking to her about Jupiter and how she thinks Jupiter is a really cool planet. And Riley said to her friend, hey, my mom's podcast has an episode about Jupiter. And her friend said, I know, I listened to it. (gasps) That's how she knew the facts about Jupiter. (laughs) Isn't that great? That's awesome. Yeah. So we're very excited that we have young listeners, too, because we're trying to be educational and fun. That's our episode. Tune in next time for another Six Degrees of Wiki. Keep up with us at SixDegreesOfWiki.com and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to let us know what you think. Looking for early access to episodes and bonus content like bloopers? Go to Patreon.com to become a Six Degrees of Wiki patron and get discounts on merch, or even help us choose degrees. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.